Rapid Knowledge Acquisition and Synthesis How to Quickly Learn, Comprehend, and Apply and Master New Information and Skills Learning How to Learn, Book 11 Written by Peter Hollins Narrated by Russell Newton Whether you're a university student trying to grasp a new skill or simply attempting to improve your performance at work, learning how to learn may well be the best skill you ever acquire. Whatever our chosen area of expertise, we'll always fare better if we pay conscious attention to how we learn, whether that's taking more effective notes, processing new information better, quickly comprehending material, or simply learning to read lightning fast. How we learn is what gets us from point A to point B. It's the vehicle that we drive, and we can choose to arrive in a rusted jalopy or a smooth and sleek Ferrari. We often assume there's only one way to learn, or that people will naturally find the optimal approach without trying too hard. We believe everyone learns through processes that they are most comfortable and thus productive with. Nothing could be further from the truth. Effective learning is a meta-skill that improves our ability to learn all other skills, and it's something we need to deliberately and consistently cultivate in ourselves if we hope to improve. This book is about learning, about how to become better at acquiring, processing, and retaining knowledge and skills of all kinds. Learning is a complex process of being aware of, managing, comprehending, absorbing, synthesizing, and recalling information on an ongoing basis. The better we're able to manipulate and handle information according to our goals and needs, the more deeply we understand and the more thorough our learning process. With that being said, why do so few people spend time developing their ability to learn? Why is there not more attention paid to learning for its own sake, or to sharpening those abilities that support and enable all our other ones? Unfortunately, becoming better at learning is seldom easy. There are obstacles that prevent people from fully exploring their intellectual potential and have them operating at a lower less efficient level out of pure habit. This is why we'll begin this book not with the techniques themselves, but with all the things that ordinarily impede our mastery of them. In removing our own resistance, we'll gain better access to better learning. It's not about smarts. Can you think of any potential obstacles to learning? If you're like most people, you might have listed poor time management, not having great study skills, or simply lacking intelligence. Maybe the kind of environments where you typically try to learn, home, school, etc., haven't been the most conducive to acquiring knowledge. Distractions and negative past experiences, such as bad teachers or boring one-dimensional school curricula, are all reasons why someone might be turned off by the concept of learning something new. In rare cases, obstacles might be presented by physical disabilities, such as perceptual or memory issues. The truth, however, is that most learning attempts are jeopardized way before you get to the stage of sitting down to learn. In other words, the obstacles that are most likely to derail your effective learning are usually psychological and behavioral, not strategic. This means that improving your methods may have a very limited effect in the first instance if you haven't addressed the deeper barriers that are preventing you from ever getting started with them. Firstly, this is not a matter of laziness or a poor attitude. In fact, many of the mental and psychological obstacles we'll discuss here are simply part of human nature or are otherwise encouraged and even rewarded in our workplaces, schools, and society in general. Human beings want to learn in many cases because they desire mastery. What is mastery? except the ability to control and command something. Instead of being at the mercy of an unknown, we might seek to dismantle and understand it, so that it's us who can then manipulate, control, or predict the phenomena we confront in the world around us. But it's this need for control that can actually backfire in the learning process. In our struggle to regain control and to avoid any state of vulnerability or ignorance, we may act in ways that actually limit our perspective and keep us failing harder and for longer. Stemming from this larger unconscious motivation 
is the need to think of learning as mere problem solving, as something we do to win over our colleagues, over our own weakness, over nature itself. It follows then that we'll be squeamish and intolerant of losing, or what we characterize as losing, and so behave again in ways that actually ensure we lose all the more often. This is often a question of ego, pride, and the avoidance of the nasty feeling of failure. As you may have noticed in other areas of your life, this avoidance of pain can be a quite powerful motivator. Using learning and knowledge acquisition as a means to increase control also encourages us to be as rational as possible, to be infallible, perfect, complete. We'll want things to follow neat, orderly, and linear logic and be unable to bear uncertainty or ambiguity with any patience or nuance. Again, by doing so, we only close down our field of possibility and force a narrower vision of learning on ourselves. An attitude that approaches learning in this way may work in some contexts for some of the time, but it will never be as good as approaching learning with a truly open, curious mind, one that is receptive, creative, and willing to tolerate the unknown or feelings of incompetence along the road to mastery. One attitude is expansive, open-ended, and curious. The other is fearful, controlling, and narrowing. Both can lead to learning, but one path will be far easier and more successful. Being bad at learning is seldom a question of technique and more a problem of attitude or perspective. Today, there is a popular model proposed by psychology professor Carol Dweck outlining the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. This model closely mirrors the fundamental differences in attitude one might bring to learning. A fixed mindset is just that, fixed, static. This is the person who insists that the experience of life come to them in a predictable, unalterable way. This is the person who believes that human abilities are inborn and that you either have or don't have. Creativity, intelligence, or being a fast learner are simply attributes you possess in an unchanging way. A fixed mindset implies a view of the world and yourself that downplays deep and genuine learning. After all, if you are already all that you can be, what more is there to learn? it would be largely impossible beyond a few tiny improvements. You look at other successful people and assume that things were simply easier for them because they were smarter or more talented. This close identification between skill and identity also means that failure is not just failure. It's a damning statement about your worth as a human being. You don't fail. You are a failure. With a fixed mindset, not understanding or knowing something is embarrassing and experienced as a deficit in character, something that should be hidden or denied. Not exactly the right conditions for learning to occur. On the other hand, a growth mindset sees learning in an entirely different light, as something that is dynamic, constantly moving, and always possible to change. With this mindset, we don't see ourselves as saddled with an unchanging set of abilities, but rather as living and developing beings who can grow and improve with effort. Whereas a person with a fixed mindset will give up quickly, why try when you can't do it immediately and easily? The person with a growth mindset knows that struggling is just part of the process. They expect to feel a little stupid when they begin, and it doesn't stop them. Failure doesn't threaten their identity. They're okay with making mistakes, because it doesn't say anything about who they are. It's merely a step in their journey, and they see all learning as a process that necessarily involves a little trial and error. While the person with a fixed mindset will avoid challenge and gravitate to only those areas where they can be assured of winning, a person with a growth mindset isn't scared off by difficult tasks, by the feeling of being a beginner, or by having to try over and over before getting better. Put another way, these two mindsets see learning differently. Fixed as a means of control, growth as a means of satisfying curiosity. One seeks to dominate and command the skill in question, while the other is willing to approach it humbly, to submit to the learning curve involved, and become a disciple, i.e., one who takes the path of conscious discipline, 
to the process of learning, rather than merely wanting to rush to the flashy end result or outcome. Ironically, it's those people who possess more raw intelligence who may be especially bad at learning. Being blessed with large amounts of talent can easily blind us into thinking that inborn skill is the only thing that matters. Experts and professionals of all kinds can fall into a trap precisely because they've been primed by their own experience and past expectation, i.e., they are even less able to see the world clearly with a beginner's mind and an open-ended curiosity instead of a blanket assumption about how every problem should be solved. We'll also lose the chance to develop learning skills and techniques if we've skated by largely by the luck of a gigantic memory or talent of rapid understanding. Or, sometimes, we think that we're good at learning, when in fact we're only habituated in one small, particular style of thinking that we have learnt over time. We may think we're being creative problem solvers, when we're really operating in a very narrow set of assumptions. Similarly, we may believe that we're trying to understand the information in front of us, when in fact what we're doing is not saying, what are you, but how can I control you and get the better of you for my own benefit? Maybe it's all about avoiding failure. The fixed mindset rears its head in all manners of fear and failure. The inner monologue seems to go like this. If I fail, it will mean that I'm a bad person, and I can't bear that. It's better that I don't even try at all than try and fail. This only has the effect of sabotaging any positive effort and dooming it to failure before we even begin to learn. This particular obstacle can partner up with the previous one. When we feel pressured into a challenge we don't feel equal to, we can unconsciously avoid, delay, or pull back from our learning in an effort to never be judged a failure. If others' expectations of us are high or unreasonable, procrastination can be something of a self-preservation tactic designed to spare us from not performing up to scratch. But what's so bad about failure, really? If we can uncouple our sense of self-worth from our performance, failure will no longer threaten us. Failure isn't something we are. It's merely something we do. A low tolerance for failure, or for poor performance, or bumbling around unskillfully, gives us a clue that we may be operating from a fixed mindset. Author Stephen McCraney said, A master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. And it's true. Many of the most successful people today have suffered miserable failures before they experienced success. The founder of e-commerce giant Alibaba, Jack Ma, is worth $36 billion today. However, as a college graduate, he was rejected for over 30 jobs, including one at KFC. Speaking of KFC, Colonel Sanders himself was rejected 109 times before someone would believe in his chicken recipe. Other big names like Walt Disney and Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks, similarly faced hundreds of rejections, yet their persistence ensured that they would eventually be successful. The fact is that failure is not only possible, it's likely. It's necessary. The massive proliferation of success stories deludes us into thinking that failure is only for the incompetent, that the successful are fated to be so. But in truth, it is our failures that teach us what we need to turn the tide. When you were a baby, you simply didn't get up one day and start walking perfectly. Instead, you bumbled over a period of time, sometimes falling over, sometimes needing a little help, sometimes trying a new technique, or reverting back to crawling. You would not have learnt to walk any faster if you had been judgmental of yourself or condemned any fall as a failure. When you resist failure, you are, in fact, resisting learning itself, since the two are inseparable. As Albert Einstein once said, a person who never made a mistake never tried anything new. A person who is learning a new dance choreography may try to do a complicated move 40 times before mastering it. However, if they shy away from those 40 wrong attempts, they never get it right. If you have a fear of failure, there are a few ways to tackle it. 
get to the root of what failure and success actually means to you. Work at redefining this definition for yourself so that you truly accept failure as a necessary and valuable part of the learning process. Deliberately set out to fail. Make a plan to play around with any goal of how your efforts should look. Try things out, mess around, and try to see what doesn't work. The idea is not to perform and be perfect, but to grow, learn, and experiment. Constantly remind yourself that you have value whether you succeed or fail, that who you are has nothing to do with your achievement on any one task. Try giving yourself many rewards and accolades along the way to mark your successes at checkpoints on the road to mastery. This will remind you that you are learning even when you feel like you're not making progress. On the other hand, some people may unconsciously fear success. Why? It comes down to pressure again. If I perform well on this, then I set a new precedent and everyone will expect more from me. And I don't want that. Again, the antidote is to disentangle your identity from your performance and relinquish your focus on the outcome in favor of optimizing the process it takes to get there. Closely connected to the obstacle of fear of failure is low self-esteem, or the idea that we are worthless, useless, or somehow not as good as everyone else. For those suffering from both, failure isn't just a sign of incompetence. It is a confirmation of what they suspected all along. If you sincerely believe that you will fail, or even that you're not deserving of success, then you will never really try wholeheartedly, and even if you do succeed at something, you will not acknowledge or enjoy it. As an example, a student may consistently do poorly at exams, not because they're unintelligent or incapable of hard work, but because they don't really believe they're the kind of person who deserves good things in life, or they think success and achievement are really for other people and not them. Without even knowing it, they may jeopardize themselves, undermining their attempts before they even start, downplaying their achievements and setting up self-fulfilling prophecies that confirm their beliefs about themselves. To fix the problem, the instinct may be to praise yourself for what you achieve. Teachers often resort to over-the-top compliments and admiration to get a student to believe in themselves, but this can backfire. As long as a person believes their value as a human being is tied into their performance on a task, they'll never possess true self-esteem or any sense of their own inner drive and motivation. An authentically confident person is able to say, I did poorly on this task. That's okay. I'm going to try harder next time. And never once assumes that they're lazy, bad, stupid, or untalented. On the other hand, a confident person will also approach their achievements in the same way. I did well on this task. That's great. But I'm going to keep going without ever thinking that they're finished with learning for good and can now rest on their laurels. Again, it's the difference between a growth and fixed mindset. Sometimes focusing on the final goal can be debilitating, since it only reinforces how far you have to go. Instead, if low self-esteem is tripping up your learning, try, as much as possible, to forget about the end goal, at least for a while. Make smaller targets or create objectives that are related to your effort and not the outcome. For example, tell yourself that you'll spend an hour on your new venture each day, or read a chapter, or work on one section of your project. These goals are always achievable, whether you succeed or not. Goals like get an A, beat my previous time, or win such and such award are trickier, because you're not always in control of whether these will be fulfilled or not. You are always in control, however, of how much effort you make and the attitude you have when you pitch up to learn. More Effective Goal Formation Having said that, goals are still important. However, it's worth thinking about different kinds of goals and the different functions they could serve. You've probably heard that it's wise to make SMART goals, i.e. those that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-sensitive. This means that it's better to say, to improve my conversational English, I'm going to learn 50 new English phrasal verbs by the end of the month, instead of, 
I'm going to get better at English. Goals, however, can go further than this. We've seen that it's easier to achieve process goals. I'm going to study 10 hours versus outcome goals. I'm going to pass with a distinction. But a goal is more than just a marker you set in the future. It's a commitment and a conscious decision for an intention that's important to you. Your objective can be anything you want it to be. You could, for example, simply set the goal that you will face all the challenges you encounter in a new learning module with patience and determination. This is a goal about the meta-learning process itself, rather than the specific content you're studying. Goals always work best when they tap into your deeper motivation. We've seen that it's harder to work on a thing that you don't genuinely care about. Goals need to speak to your inner desires and the reason why you're learning in the first place. It can be useful to imagine how you will be different once you have learned what you need to learn or acquire the skills you want to acquire. Becoming better at anything is so much more than just acquiring certain skills or bits of knowledge. It also comes with a shift in perspective and attitude, perhaps a more global, creative, or compassionate worldview. Perhaps the maturity to not be freaked out by mistakes. Perhaps the experience gained from having to be patient and trusting as the learning unfolds. The ability to take responsibility, to be proactive, to dig into what the goal really means for you. If you can understand the motivational engine behind your goals, you know how to tap into that when learning is difficult. Whether you're simply trying to learn something small and quick, or attempting a grand project that will take many years, your aim is essentially to transform who you are now into the version of yourself that is proficient in this area. What will that look like, and what will that take? Find out what your motivation is, and you've won half the battle. Style, Format, and Sources Some barriers to your learning are obvious. The information you need to take on board is simply presented in a confusing way that hinders your understanding rather than helps it. If you've ever had a terrible lecturer at university, you'll know what a big difference presentation can make. Unhelpful learning environments can undo all your hard work. Think about the effect of constant interruptions, distraction, an environment that's too hot or cold, noisy, not bright enough, not private, or not comfortable. Think about the form your learning materials take. Are you relying heavily on text-based materials when you're a more practically oriented, hands-on learner? Are you using poor quality or outdated tools? Or practicing with exercises or instruments that are too advanced for you? Especially if you're embarking on self-teaching, you need to pay special attention to supporting your learning in every way possible. Invest time and energy into getting the right materials, tools, software, ingredients, teachers, and so on that you'll need to do your best. Often, you'll find that discovering these support materials only takes minimal effort. Depending on the type of resources and the specific topic you're trying to learn about, a few Google searches might well suffice in pointing you to productive tools for learning. However, Keep in mind that popularity does not necessarily mean utility, and learning is not one-size-fits-all. The fact that many people have tried or even found a particular resource helpful does not mean you will too. Instead, focus on descriptions and make informed choices based on them. If one mode of learning isn't working for you, you don't need to force yourself along. Try something different. Ask a different teacher, source study guides, or online forums, watch YouTube videos, or get a practiced expert to show you in person. Listen to audiobooks or take notes according to your own learning preference. The more you mix things up, the better. We'll explore this more later in the book. If you're not doing well with some study materials, you might find you can learn a lot by designing your own improved materials or supplementing as you see fit. Whatever your area of learning, use plenty of imagery and metaphor mnemonics, video and audio, presentations or podcasts, webinars, tutorials, hands-on practice, mind mapping diagrams, summarizing, or even compiling a lesson to teach others. The important thing is that you proactively take charge of your own learning. If you encounter difficulties, 
Become curious about why and find a path around it. If you're disorganized, spend an afternoon devising your own protocols that are completely unique to you. If you're unimpressed with your teacher or trainer, get another one or seek out a few different teaching perspectives. Sometimes you can learn best when you're forced to forge your own path. Be glad when you have the opportunity to really puzzle your way through a challenge. It's often the knowledge you attain while struggling that is best anchored in your mind. Takeaways Learning new things to increase your knowledge and skill set sounds good in theory, but many of us hesitate to try learning something new. We cite common excuses like not having enough time, not having access to good resources, or fearing failure in new endeavors. Our years in school have left us with the impression that learning is one-dimensional and utterly boring, yet this is far from the case. Here is where learning how to learn becomes so important. Those of us who are afraid to learn are often unknowingly suffering from a fixed mindset. This way of thinking assumes that people are born with a static set of qualities and talents that never change. If we aren't immediately successful at something, we just don't have what it takes. Yet, this sort of thinking is extraordinarily unhelpful, as it prevents us from exposing ourselves to new skills and knowledge. Fixed mindsets are particularly common in people who fear failure, have low self-esteem, or excuse themselves by pretending to be too busy. For them, failure isn't a natural part of learning, but a damning indictment of one's abilities. They fail to recognize that mistakes are as natural as breathing, and that learning well necessarily involves failing, and failing repeatedly. However, if we adopt a growth mindset, wherein the possibilities for development and expansion are endless, we find that we're much more open to learning, as well as failure in learning. Some common issues that people face when trying to learn new things include not forming their goals properly and failing to discover good resources to study. While both of these issues are surmountable for those with a growth mindset, they become impossible to overcome if you have a fixed mindset that refuses to consider more than one option. As such, cultivating a growth mindset is essential to learning new skills and acquiring more knowledge. This has been Rapid Knowledge Acquisition and Synthesis, How to Quickly Learn, Comprehend, and Apply, and Master New Information and Skills. Learn How to Learn, Book 11, written by Peter Hollins, narrated by Russell Newton. Copyright 2020 by Peter Hollins. Production copyright by Peter Hollins.